James Worthy, who is getting my worst take of the week, <laughs> said that was the dunk of the century. The century? The century. That's not even the best dunk of LeBron's career. The New York Knicks are absolutely rolling and things are just completely falling apart in Golden State Warriors. We're going to spend most of the pod talking about those two teams, maybe a little Lakers at the end. You know, they're very up and down. Let's get into foul trouble. All right, the New York Super Knicks. Let's let's just go over the last four games. 112-106 over Minnesota. 116-100 over Chicago. 128-92 over Philly. 125-105 to the Wizards. 4-0 since the OG and an OB trade. In 138 minutes on the court with OG, the Knicks are plus 85. That's sustainable, That right? That, that'll, no. that'll carry on for the rest <laughs> of the year. Um, no, but all jokes aside, they've looked... It, their roster is starting to make more sense. Yes, their their starting lineup is starting to make more sense. Yeah. I I don't want to be negative for a team that's 4-0, but I feel like watching them did not reinforce some of these like point differentials I saw in the final score. Yeah, it was, it's definitely a little bit fluky like you look at what that I think I really f- tried to focus on that Sixers game because that is like the big splash of like we beat the Sixers by like 20 points. And it's like that a, a game where Julius Randle is shooting one for 11 and you've got, um you know, Miles McBride and four Quentin threes Drive and one quarter eight threes between the two of them. <laughs> yeah. like, that is not going to sustain. But. I think we're kind of burying the lead. Like what they're able to do with OG Ananobi is a complete game changer for them. And I thought it was really interesting. Like this is a guy that can guard easily one through four. And the way that they can just deploy him on a Tyrese Maxey is super special. And like, especially for that matchup in particular. Yeah, no, I noticed that too, that OG started on Maxey. I mean, yeah, I mean, one of the things I wrote that I really like about this team is it's like you don't look at this five-man unit and go like, wow, this is going to be an elite transition team. This is going to be an elite like fast break team. But they're so good at forcing turnovers because they've just got high energy like DiVincenzo, Ananobi. It's like guys – Hartenstein too is these guys who really want to like poke at the ball, get steals. And like it feels like every time the Knicks are like transitioning from defense to offense, there's like – always like two more Knicks on the screen than whoever the other team is. And it's like they're a really good like – attacking team because of the hustle just because like guys are like oh i'm not just going to assume my teammate's going to make the layup like i'm going to go up the court and chase after him too absolutely and low-key they're like big now they're really with big guys now. who play big yeah and i think one thing that's interesting about this team i noticed that too is it's like randall's not the tallest like ananobi's like pretty prototypical size but it's not just height it's like thickness it's like brunson's like kind of a stockier guy it's like you're like i noticed this a lot of their sets kind of involve like randall at the top Hartenstein setting a screen with the two guards in that left wing and then Ananobi's alone on the weak side and it's like when Ananobi's the one attacking the closeouts like he's not the greatest finisher at the rim but like he's big yeah and then when he's attacking and Randall's down there and Hartenstein's down there and it's these three guys who just occupy so much space like it's a lot to handle so let's set the picture a little bit for like where we were standing on the Knicks and then where we are standing on the Knicks more now before the OG trade, what did you view like the Knicks ceiling as? Kind of like five, six seed. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm right there. I mean, I think for like a regular season seed thing, it's it's so hard to say. Like, you know, you can be the two seed and I me mean, not have very much belief in you from like a playoff standpoint. But I, I definitely viewed them as a team that could probably win one round. If they were playing really well and they found the right matchup. And I definitely think more of them now than I did. I think there is a little bit of fool's gold, though, in this 4-0 start. Because the bench is... So, I mean, I think the big thing with this trade is, like, you lose Emmanuel quickly. Before this trade, the Knicks whole thing was, like, our bench is freaking awesome. Outside of the Philly game, the bench is negative by a lot in all of these games. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, I don't want to, like, say the Philly game is a little fluky, but it's a weird game where, like, first possession of the game, Joel Bede rolls his ankle. And then I watched the game after it happened, so I know the whole time, like, the Knicks are going to win the first quarter 34-30. And it's, like, 
26 20 with like three minutes left and i'm like how the hell does new york win this quarter by four points how do they score 14 points like Philly proceeds to lose two uncontested rebounds off their own hands. Miles McBride hits yeah, four threes in the last like flame coming and it's out a of little his ears. Like, huh? Okay, so that's the weird thing. Their bench is just like not that good. I mean, Hart is like playing a lot of minutes with starters, so a lot of times he's kind of like shows looks like he's doing pretty good. But the bench is getting outscored a lot in these games, and I don't know if the starting lineup is going to sustain this like insane outscoring of the other team. I wanted to go back to the shooting, though, because what makes this, this Knicks team so different than a lot of other ones is like Brunson, 43% from three. DiVincenzo, 44% from three. Ananobi, 37% from three. Like Randall's at 28, but we know Randall's a little bit better than that, and Hardenstein obviously likes to camp in the paint. It's like this team can shoot, and I think that while I'm saying it's a little bit of fool's gold, I also think there's a lot of meat on the bone that this team isn't eating at yet that I think their their starting lineup, which has been really good during this stretch, could actually be even better. Because um, one thing I don't like about this starting lineup is, man, the amount of Julius Randle post-ups and isos. Yeah. But the thing is, there was that season where Randle was averaging like six assists his first year in New York, was getting like triple doubles every once in a while. Like... I sent you a picture of this, but there's a possession where they force Maxi onto Randall. And Randall's just so like tunnel vision, I'm gonna score the ball here because Maxi's on me, that he like takes like two dribbles like to the left and just pulls up for a mid-range. But Embiid is like, oh shit, Randall's Maxi's guarding Randall. I'm gonna go into the paint. Ubre slides down to take Embiid's guy. And there's like enough time on the shot clock where Randall either could have kicked out to a wide open OG and Anobi, or the Knicks could have tried to maybe get the ball to Hardenstein while Ubre's on him. But Randall's just so like I feel like cons- not concerned, but he's just so like score first. His mentality seems like it's really become so score first that it's like if Randall can dial back the shooting mentality to like pass it more i really think this knicks offense has so much more room to grow because teams still treat randall like this like 1a threat when he gets the ball around the basket and i don't even think he really is that no not not at all and and that's like why i'm worried about this team i think it's like once teams start like trapping brunson in the playoffs and it it comes to a point where julius randall is going to make have to make every decision for this team and the the ball starts pinging around the wings like that's when this Knicks team gets a little messy like they've got four of their huge minute guys have du- have a double digit turnover percentage I think they they have they are a little bit suspect in like overpassing a bit they another thing that I Definitely don't love is their backup big situation post the Mitchell Robinson trade. Like Precious is just not what they need. Hardenstein, I actually like love the infusion of passing that he gives this starting lineup that uh, Mitchell Robinson wasn't wouldn't have really given them. Um, but yeah, I think they need one more guy that like I really trust to either be able to go get his own bucket or be able to make the right decision when the opportunity presents itself. Yeah, I think that, I think it could just be better if they dial the like Randall attempts a little bit more toward Brunson, let Brunson do it. There's one issue with Brunson that I noticed when I was doing my film study for this is that Man, the Knicks offense is really predictable. Like, if Brunson mm-hmm. runs that pick and roll on the left side, he's always attacking. He's always going for rim pressure, pulling up at the mid-range or going to the rim. If Run- Brunson runs that pick and roll on the right side, he's always pulling up for three. And you see it in his shot chart. All of his three-point attempts are on the right wing. All of his mid-range and rim attempts are on that left side of the court. And that's one of those things that I'm like, you get to the playoffs, and you go against the Miami Heat, and the Heat are like, oh, okay, yeah. cool, like, we know, like, if if James and his apartment can figure out what you're doing in an hour of film study, like, we know even more than that. And I think that's what scares me about the Knicks is there's just this very, like, every possession down, OG goes to the right. DiVincenzo goes to the left wing. Brunson goes to the left corner. Randall will be at, be, be at the top. And it's like, we need we need a bit more. We need a bit more. I think, like, this team actually could just skyrocket ceiling-wise if they replaced Randall with a playmaking wing. The problem is, is it's like, 
Those don't grow on trees. Well, those don't grow on trees. And it's like the big, you know, dynamo wing that's on the market supposedly is Markinen. And Markinen is a significantly worse playmaker than Randall is. So that's where it's like, <laughs> where do we go from here? I think that's the problem is I see the template for this team to ascend into title contention if they can make that trade. But who's it for? What team wants to take on Randall? It's it's tough for them. Yeah, I, I was really surprised. Did you happen to check out what Jalen Brunson's percentage from two point has been this season? He's shooting 49% from the two-point area, and that's in the 38th percentile for all point guards, which is, like, really, like, rough. And and that's another number that that scares me once you get into the into playoff. Things tighten up a little bit, See, gets more half-court. I think this kind of goes back to the structure of the Knicks' offense, though, because, again, like— when they run that pick and roll with Brunson where he's actually going downhill, it's always like Hartenstein's there. Randall doesn't seem to know what he's doing if he doesn't have the ball a lot of the times. And it's like a lot of times it'll be like Hartenstein, Randall, DiVincenzo on one side of the court with Brunson trying to run a pick and roll and then OG and Anobi on the other side. And it's like you guys have spacing, but spacing doesn't matter if everyone stands next to each other. Like move DiVincenzo across the court, like bring OG a little bit closer to the top, like space the floor out a little bit. Like, I don't know. It seems like there's some like easy coaching adjustments that could just kind of help the Brunson pick and roll materialize. The other thing too is Hardenstein doesn't really like hard roll to the rim. Mm-hmm. He's kind of more like that Embiid type big where it's like, I'm going to catch it in the short roll and kind of operate from there. Yeah, make a decision after that. Yeah, but Arnstein doesn't have that, like, soft floater touch that Embiid or, you know, obviously he's not an Embiid or Jokic, but he's, or a Shengun, but he's not one of those guys that's really capitalizing on those, like, 12-foot push shots in a way that the Knicks kind of need, I feel like. Totally. And maybe, maybe that's what we're coming to the conclusion of is so far this season, this team has been really good because of its offense. And I think maybe that that's what it is. They need to be really great because of their defense if they want to succeed in, in the playoffs. And their defense is really good. I've like really loved what I've seen from them defensively. Like I just love that it really feels like all five guys on the court at any given time for the Knicks are like they're dialed in. Absolutely. Like they're forcing loose balls. They're jumping after loose balls. Like any ball that's in the air, like at least three Knicks are jumping over to go get it. Like. There is a big advantage they have over these, like, other teams. Like, the Philly game we talked about was weird, but, like, the Wizards game. Obviously, the Wizards are, like, one of those teams that's, like, bleh, right? And the Knicks are better than them. But it's, like, the first quarter of that game, it's kind of, like, both teams are in a bit of a lull. But the Knicks just keep, like, building the lead because it's, it's like, they force a Kuzma turnover. They score. And then, like, they're dialed completely in the next possession. And it's, like... That edge is huge in the regular season, but you don't get that edge in the playoffs as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's everybody's just as dialed in once the playoffs come around. Um, yeah, so like what kind of, what archetype of a player would you most want to add to the Knicks? Like just some sort of, like a three that can play make and put, you know, OG at the four. So I know they're trying to get Brogdon, which I do like for them because mm-hmm. we talked about McBride in that Philly game. So McBride shot 25% as a rookie, 30% second year, and now he's shooting 47% from three. I imagine that regresses because this is a guy who's taking like one attempt a game on a lot of game from three. So it's like really small sample size theater. Like I, I know the Knicks are like really high in McBride. He's a bit short. He's like six one. I'm I just I'm little, I'm worried about this bench. And I know in the playoffs, I'm I think what scares me about this Knicks team for this year when it comes to the playoffs, as we talked about, is like that intensity edge becomes a little bit less in the playoffs. Obviously, your bench is going to play less. So like it's better that the starting lineup is good than the bench is good. But it's like if the starting lineup can't hang with some of these teams, that's where we run into an issue. Um, so I know they want to make the Brogdon trade, but, and I think that will really, that would be like a Fournier for Brogdon close to like one to one. But like, so here's the Dick's like kind of assets. They have their own first round pick this year. They have the Mavericks first round pick this year. That's top 10 protected. They have a Pistons first round pick this year. That's top 18 protected a Wizards first round pick this year. That's top 12 protected. So they're going to get that Mavericks pick, which is going to be the Mavericks first round pick probably anywhere in the high teens, the low twenties. And then they have their own first round pick every year till, you know, the end of time. I, I feel like this the way people have been talking about the Knicks the last like couple of years has been like, watch out for the Knicks. They have all these assets. Like, what 
I'm a little confused what assets we're talking about that are so sweet here. Um, I mean, it's their own picks, right? That's the that's the sweetest stuff that they got. Yeah, I, I guess it's their own picks, but like every team has their own. I mean, twenty nine pick, not contenders. I mean, but even most contenders will have their twenty twenty nine pick. Like, I don't know, man. I'm a little like. Because they have four first-round picks in this draft, theoretically. Because the Pistons one is eventually going to convey into seconds, as is the Wizards ones. That's how those deals are structured. So it's like, I don't know. I feel like the Knicks almost like like need to trade those. Because it's like, those are going to turn into seconds. Like, I don't know. No, I'm I'm with you that it makes a lot of sense to cash in your chips sooner rather than later. It sucks that they don't have Mitchell Robinson for this like end-of-the-season run. Um, I think the momentum's kind of going more towards they're going to make their big deal this summer. But to your point, I think those picks being first round picks and a team being able to sell their fan base of we traded X player for, you know, six first round picks. But it's like fake first round picks unless you're getting those future Knicks picks. I I don't know. I, I don't I like I try to play with the trade machine for like an hour to figure out like where does Randall go? But there's like none of the bad teams really have the type of player that the Knicks need. And none of the like kind of good ish teams are like at a point where I think they're ready to sell for Randall and picks to give up that type of player. So I think the Knicks are, well, I don't think it would be Randall. I, I, I think Randall has to go, but how are they replacing that? I, I, in my mind, it revolves around an Evan Fournier deal. But that's, that's like but I think that's the, the bulk the key, of right? the money. You combine the Fournier salary, like the 18, with the Randall 25 to get to that 43 range. And that's your kind of... And then it's that with picks is kind of your... I don't know. I, I don't know. If like, you're trying to get up to like a 30 like million dollar range, you could throw in a, the DiVincenzo piece if you're getting like a guard that's going to sop up a lot of minutes as well. But I get what you're saying. Like, if you're trying to, like, do a Zach Levine trade, that's impossible, I, I which I don't to, love. Yeah, I don't want them to do a Levine trade. I I, I think Randall has to go for this just because, like, I think what I've learned from watching them more and more is, like, he's just not great off the ball. Yeah. And I, he's just dialed to shoot a little too much. If you push him down the food chain, though, I think – Everything I think he becomes a more effective player if there's another guy like let's say a Donovan Mitchell or or just something. I don't think he does though, because in other situations, because it wasn't until he joined the Knicks where he really kind of blossomed. Like w- with New Orleans, he was like a 20 point per game guy, but it was always kind of like, oh, okay. I don't I don't know. It, it's like at that first year at the Knicks is really where we started seeing like playmaking Randall, mm-hmm. triple double Randall. It's but that's like, what I'm saying. With less defensive attention, like it makes the passing easier. Easier. It makes the scoring easier. Obviously, J- Jalen Brunson is like taking so much attention as well. I and I just think like there are no like wings with the upside of a Julius Randall out there to replace him with. But is there a world this summer where like maybe the Clippers flame out, Harden gets hurt, and they're like, hey, Paul George, you're a free agent. Yeah. And they maybe orchestrate some sort of sign and trade for a Paul George. Like, But I, I don't know. I'm just like, yeah, I guess a Paul George would be like a really great case scenario or like maybe a Kawhi. But then if it's like a Kawhi. I don't feel great about signing Kawhi to his next like five year, forty five million dollar contract. I would almost rather just take these last two years of um, Randall's contract and like try to cash in for one of the one of the two guards, which would just fit so well in what they've already got cooking. I I don't know. I I I I don't know. I guess I just disagree. I just don't see it with Randall because I just don't know what he's going to look like off the ball. If he's not going to shoot very well, he's kind of shown in the existing offense. He's not the most willing and great cutter. Um, I just think as a post up option because he is undersized. Like that's the thing. It's the weird thing I noticed. Teams really f- kind of treat Randall like it's like it's like the end of the world when he gets the ball like within 15 feet of the basket but he actually he turned the ball over a lot he's not like the most that's it's it's one of those weird things with Randall he loses the ball a lot 
Yeah, like, yeah, he does. Not, not necessarily, all, not necessarily like a turnover, but like dribbles off the defender's foot. Like there's a lot of like or trying to spin move, and then all of a sudden the basketball flies twenty feet in one direction. There's a lot of that with Randall, and it's like he doesn't have that super developed post up package that someone who's doing it as much as he is. I don't know. I also don't like either like tagging all the way back to that that shot I talked about where he forced it over Maxi. Like he's also a bit short for a power forward too. So it's like someone like Maxi has a really long wingspan. Like Loki actually gets a pretty decent contest on a shot like that. And I think with Randall, like I talked about him being a Eastern All Star in our last uh, Monday pod. But the more I've done like actual film study, the more I'm like I kind of want to walk it back. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I I hear you, but I I also think the other like place where Randall gives a lot of value, although he's a little bit short for the four position, it is the modern NBA, and he's like a badass rebounder. Yeah, no, and he like is. that is where like the Knicks have really like won this season is rebounding. Like they're number five overall in rebounding from the season. They're number two in opponent rebounding, which and that's just like. One thing is like Hardenstein, there's been no drop off there from Mitchell Robinson to Hardenstein. There's been drop off from offensive rebounds, but not defensive rebounds, which the offensive rebounding is to be expected because Mitchell Robinson is just like a Marvel superhero that can only offensive rebound. I have a question. Maybe this is like, do you think there's a world where the Knicks get like some sort of more offensively innovative coach and this team could could potentially be a lot better you know potentially i I think thibodeau is like i think he gets a little flack for being like a little bit more old-fashioned than he is um like the he's constantly talking about like the knicks gotta put up more threes gotta put up more threes which which i like and i think that is like an easy avenue to to winning i don't know like Maybe uh, I guess that would just like entail like if getting Brunson off ball a little bit more, maybe like with their current personnel I, playing through Randall. I feel like right now Brunson's off the ball too much. There's just a lot of possessions where Brunson's in the corner and then like stuff's happening at the top of the key. So we're, we're you we're turning Brunson into more of like a heliocentric that kind of guard yeah but under the caveat that they can't do this whole like i know exactly what direction the pick and roll is going to result in depending on where you do it like that's a big issue with their offense i think but i think i think it's more so like maybe just more movement because there's just a lot of possessions where it feels like the knicks come down everyone stands in their spot hartenstein comes back up to the top and he sets a screen for one of the three guards and then og stands there and i think that's where i'm like can we get a little bit more like DiVincenzo sets an off-ball screen for Brunson and then he comes around the top around Hartenstein and then Randall's rolling around that other side. Like I just kind of want more like actions that involve four or five of the – like at least like three or four guys moving instead of like the standard two-man action. Yeah. I just want more like off-the-ball action with this team and I feel like that could really unlock this offense a lot more yeah I hear you and and you're probably right I mean this is like such a Tibbs team like defensive personnel wise that um it, it does hurt my heart the idea of him not coaching this squad but um I don't know it I guess it all goes down to like what they're gonna do at the end of the day with the playoffs um and to see how OG fits more long term because I, I do think that like like we said, like they need more creation outside of Brunson. And like, is Randall gonna be able to step up there with the arrival of OG? Is OG who historically has not been a guy that can pass that's at the all? Thing. Brunson is not a great, great playmaker for the mm-hmm. point guard position. Well, and now like I would say, like, obviously, quickly was their backup point guard, one of the best backup point guards in the league. Yeah, I don't know. They it's, it's they need another team, guard. It's weird that this team went 4-0 and and they blew out everybody and were kind of walking away like, uh. it, it, So I think maybe... Well, walking away of that was impressive, but is that sustainable? sustainable? Yeah, I think that's the big thing. Like, right, like, the defense, 
I think is sustainable. This team is an amazing defensive team. Is this like beating Philly by 30 sustainable? I don't think so. Oh, yeah. No. I mean, no team is yeah going to do that every gonna night. Going to do that every but night I think, for sure. I, so I guess like I guess for you, like for you, Patrick, has your thoughts on their ceiling changed at all or no? Yeah. Yeah, it has. Because just I mean, I kind of want to rattle through like how you would utilize OG against like the best and brightest of the Eastern Conference. Like who would you obviously maybe we start with the Sixers just because we already kind of touched on that. But I was really impressed with how he was affecting Maxi like and you can do a lot of different things with him. What, what did you think with that matchup and how that would maybe play out in a seven game series? I, I thought it was interesting. They, they put him on Maxi instead of DiVincenzo because from what, let, me, let me try to remember what the full matchups were. I remember they think they put Brunson on Batum. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and Batum did absolutely nothing. Batum did nothing. He's not going to do anything because Batum's not going to attack someone like Brunson off the dribble. I mean, I, from what I remember watching, Maxi actually got a, quite a few buckets at the rim because of the speed advantage. Um, and you're never going to lock up a Maxi, but I do like that. Like, yeah, I mean, Maxi was nine for twenty and one for seven from three, which obviously yeah. the three point shooting is going to be a little bit better. But that kind of, I've watched it, it. It made me think of how the Mavs guarded Chris Paul two years ago in the playoffs of like, when you put a Dorian Finney Smith on a guy that's Who's a little undersized, undersized, yeah. it's just so hard, like strength wise to get through something like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I do. I really do like that for the Knicks. I think my like kind of thing is I just think their offense is just going to get so bogged down by these, the four, the big four East teams, which I think is Boston, Milwaukee, Philly, and Miami. I think those teams are really just going to be able to bog down the Knicks offense a lot, kind of like what we saw in last year's playoffs. But how, how do you think they would use him in a Milwaukee series? I find that really interesting. They might put him on Lillard. Like, do they put him on Dame? Do they? I don't know who they have guarding Giannis. I almost think you you do put him on Lillard and just like let Giannis bang down with Hartenstein yeah. and Randall. Like, let them take the abuse. Let OG kind of be on the perimeter. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting. I I think the Knicks ceiling to me hasn't changed all that much just because I do think like they were already gonna be one of the bottom four Eastern seeds, and I still don't think they can beat one of those four teams. So for me, even You don't if I think, think they could get above one of one of those other Eastern Conference teams? I me personally I don't, unless there's a trade on the horizon that really shakes it up for them. They're only two games, two and a half games back of the Sixers, and then they're four games back of the Bucks. It, it would be a lot to get over the the Bucks, but yeah, I don't know. I, I do feel like they're one trade away. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's the world where the Bucks, like you saw that weird Giannis quote was like, the equipment manager has to be better. I have to be better. The coach has to be better. I love like, those AI memes. Did you see yeah, those? I did of the equipment manager. But yeah. it's like, okay, maybe the Bucks, like maybe we're going to see a total Bucks collapse. But like kind of seen that three times already with this Giannis Bucks team. Like, I don't. I guess it wouldn't be the weirdest thing to see them like upset the Bucks. But to play the Bucks, they'd have to drop to like six or seven. And I think they're going to be five. Yeah, that's we're headed for Miami Knicks round two. Most likely five or six. They're they're gonna be around there. I, I they gotta fight, fight like hell to get up to that four five. Because if they can sit in that four five, then they're probably gonna play or they're gonna play one of Orlando, Cleveland, Indiana, or Miami, which is a really, really Great place to be if if I'm the Knicks. And if, then, if I'm the Knicks and somehow I, I play Orlando in the first round, like, I'm so happy. Oh, yeah. I could see the Knicks, like, kind of quickly. Bully them. Bullying them, yeah. But I think that's the weird that's the weird thing with the Knicks, right? Like, last year, they bullied Cleveland, who was, like, a bully all season. And then they just got completely bullied by Miami. And it was like, what? What happened? I will say they're way better equipped to play a Miami this year. Oh yeah, significantly so. Um, yeah, that uh, that OG. I mean, I get, and you've got a guy who has experience guarding Jimmy Butler in very very high leverage playoff situations. Um, all right. 
The other side of the Knicks Raptors trade was the Raptors, who last night blew out the Golden State Warriors. So we're not talking Raptors yet. I'm actually going to go see the Raptors in person tomorrow night. So oh, there we go. Kind of excited. We'll probably talk Raptors next pod or the pod after. But the Warriors. Um, so the Athletic reported that quote Jonathan Kaminga no longer believes Kerr will allow him to reach his full potential. Um, Kuminga- Does he have a high enough Q rating to do this? No. But let, let me let me continue on this uh, this thing. So that report came out after Steve Kerr played coming only 19 minutes in a game where the Warriors blew a big lead in the final five minutes after he got subbed out for Wiggins against the Nuggets. We have Moses Moody. They've quote they've told me this is from last night after they lost to the Raptors in a blowout. Moses Moody, another guy whose minutes are people are like behind the scenes. People say Moses Moody is not happy with his role and doesn't believe he can reach his full potential. Quote they've told me a lot of it is out of my control. When it first happened, they said, I've been doing all the right stuff, playing good, circumstances, situations, things that I can't control. Um, This was Kaminga's quote. Sorry, I'm kind of bouncing around. Quote, there's no beef. We move on with better understanding, hoping we can with each other and help this team and leave everything in the past. Patrick, neither of those quotes suggest that Kaminga or Moody are happy. Um, I think why that is, is because they are not happy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so I guess let's talk about Kaminga first. So Kaminga's like a really good at the rim finisher, and he's kind of bad at everything else as it relates to basketball. He's good at being big and looking like and an being awesome athletic. basketball player. Yeah. So he's 22nd percentile in assist to usage rate. Like he doesn't, he doesn't pass much. Um, so like 44% of his shots come at the rim, 34% come at mid range. He doesn't take a lot of threes. He doesn't make a lot of the threes. He does take. I will say, to Kaminga's credit, his minutes are really inconsistent. So in his last 10 games, he's averaged 27 minutes, but like in a lot, in two of the games, he's under 20. In three of the games, he's over 30. So it's like the, not to get too mathy, but like the standard deviation of his actual minutes to reach that average is not like 28, 26, 24, 29. It's like 18, 17, 35. It's like, it, it, there's no consistency to his minutes right now. Look, they just need to cash in the Kaminga chip. It's time. It, if they want to compete this year, if they want to build a team around Steph Curry that from this point on can be a team that is competing in high leverage playoff spots, I think th- they already chose Draymond last summer. Kaminga and Draymond, they don't play well together. The last year... Their defensive rating was 114, which is like right middle of the road. And their offensive rating was 116. Like that is not a dominant team. And then this year it's been way worse because Draymond hasn't been as good. And in my mind, like they've committed to two players on this roster. That is Steph Curry and that is Draymond Green. And if you have a player that cannot play with those guys, I think it's time where you just... Even though it hurts, even though he does have potential, it's scary. He could pop off and be an all-star player on his next team. You got to cash in on the, those question marks because honestly, that's probably not going to happen. It might, but it's probably not going to happen popping off in that way. And he just doesn't fit with this style. He doesn't fit with this team. And it is now. Now is the most important thing in Golden State, and right now, they are not Not even a playoff spot. So here's what's interesting. So Moses Moody this season is averaging 17.7 minutes, and I think there's this big thing. It's like Steve Kerr doesn't play the young guys. So Patrick, how many players, so Kuminga's 21, Moody is 21, Pajimski is under 21. How many players 21 years or older do you think are playing 17.7 or more minutes per game? 21 years or younger yeah. play, playing 17 or more minutes a game um like probably like 40 it's only 30 and wow. guess what moody kaminga and pajimski are on the list there's actually no team in the nba that's playing young guys as many heavy minutes as this team 
Wow. So I think Steve Kerr's got to get that like tattooed on his neck. I, I kind of want to like back this up because I was I went through the list of 30. So there's like 30 players, 21 years or younger, averaging 17.7 or more minutes, which is Kaminga's minutes. And it's like these are the type of players that average that at that age. Really good players like Paulo Bancaro, Alperin Shengun or Chet Holmgren. Or they're players who are on really bad teams like Shaden Sharp, Brandon Miller, Jalen Duran. And like those six names I named are Kaminga, Moody or Pajimski. They're not in the same ballpark as those six guys, right? No. But literally 10% of 21 years or younger players are these Warriors guys. And I, I kind of want to like flash back because I think what's like really been interesting about this Warriors team is there's always been this like dichotomy between like what it was like for the young Steph Warriors versus what it's been like for the young current Warriors. Steph and Clay were rookies at 21. Draymond's rookie season was at 22 years old. And like this is the thing with the Warriors. The old guys don't want to sit and watch the young guys lose games. The young guys don't want to sit and watch the old guys lose games. The reality is it doesn't matter if Kerr gives Kaminga 30 minutes or he gives Clay 30 minutes. Like, this team's going to be losing. They're just not a good team. Like, going over the age of their top five guys, Steph, 35, Clay, 33, Chris Paul, 38, Andrew Wiggins, 28, Draymond Green, 33. These guys are all 33 years or older. Like, 33 is usually when you see NBA players break down. And I think because, like, Steph, Durant, LeBron and even Chris Paul are playing at such a high level. It's kind of skewed the way we should actually view these older NBA players, which is the reality is like once guys hit 33, like they tend to suck. Yeah. Yeah. That NBA history has definitely taught us that. I'm glad you brought up Chris Paul as well. Chris Paul, um, he just broke his hand as yeah. well. Uh, he's expected to be out four to six weeks. And part of why I think it's like kind of crucial for them to start cashing in on some of these young guys is Chris Paul has been so good for these young guys. Like the, especially on the defensive side of the ball, like the, the warriors with um, Kaminga on and Chris Paul off have a 117 defensive rating with them on together. 113 with Pods and Paul together, 109 defensive rating. With Paul off, 119 defensive rating. Like, he has been so awesome to kind of usher in these, these young players for the Warriors, play these bench minutes. And one, I, I don't know if Chris Paul might have played his last game as a Warrior. And I just think it, it those bench units might really start to get super ugly without Chris Paul on the floor as well. Yeah, I think, like, it's kind of like, that's the thing. I think everybody, because the Warriors two years ago win a championship, last year they, you know, they're in the second round of the playoffs. Like, I think everyone's like, this team is good. This team is good. Why aren't they good? Why isn't Kerr, you know, fixing it? And I think the reality is, like, I don't think there is a blend of minutes that makes this team good. Yeah, with the current pieces, I, I yeah, just, I don't I'm not see it. sure. Like, and here's the thing, like, Wiggins has regressed, right? Wiggins has kind of regressed to, like, Minnesota Wiggins what's the difference between like the Warriors from two years ago and Minnesota is like way better players around Wiggins like now that the pieces around Wiggins have deteriorated it's not a coincidence that Wiggins has kind of regressed to what he looks like in that sort of team environment yeah I, I think that's a great point it's I do think that they're better than their record is right now. They've had a lot of really close games. They've had a lot of injury problems. Obviously, like Draymond Green was considering retirement. Um, he has done literally nothing for them this season. Uh, I, I think they're a playing team if everything goes right for them and everything's went wrong for them. Um, I, man, I... I don't want to be an idiot and say they're not a playing team because I could totally see this team rattling off like a nine and three stretch that like propels them sometime in like February or March. But like I just this Lakers slide is not going to last forever. And like the Suns are another team that's kind of in that 10 spot. And like we talked about Suns are pretty good when the three guys play. We don't know how much they're going to play together, but like. Even if this team kind of rallies, I do feel like a lot of the teams that are right ahead of them that they're going to try to jump are also kind of due for a rally as well. And I think that's where it's a little like. I know it's which, which rally is going to be the stronger it, rally. Yeah, more yeah. more real. Which one's going to last the longest? And, you know, I don't think Utah's going to put down the gas pedal, but they've won 10 of their last 13 games and they are a half game back of the Warriors right now. Yeah. So here's the thing with this team. 
Paul's contract is not guaranteed for next year. And obviously Clay's gonna be free agent. Like to your point, either you trade the young guys or you let the old guard leave this season and give the young guys more minutes next year. I think that's what it is. Cause you're not gonna as much as it's like, okay, let's play Kaminga, Moody, Pajimski all these minutes, it's like you're not gonna play Clay Thompson. 22 minutes a game you're not gonna play Draymond green 18 minutes a game right like that's just not but you know what when i mean you're totally right and that's why i think it's even more vital that you start trading these young guys because if you just hold on to them and let your old guys walk your old guys that are making all this money guess what you're not getting rid of steph curry so then you just start locking yourself into Indiana Pacers land where you have like the 13th pick every year. And it's like, yeah, sure. Maybe you luck out and get a uh, Devin Booker in, or in a your, Bam out of bio or a yeah. Bam out of bio. But, you know, it's a lot more likely that you're going to draft a couple Jerome Robinsons. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I guess. So you think they should just trade Kaminga and Moody. I I almost. I almost think if I'm the Warriors, maybe I'm a little too pessimistic. I think the window's closed. I if I'm the them, window might be closed, but you cannot close it. You cannot lock it when you, Steph is still in the room. But but on the flip side, though, I don't know if these guys have enough value to give you something that's not going to lock it by trading them. I think they're enough of a sweet. At least I think Kaminga is enough of a sweetener. Like you can, it's super easy to sell yourself on like that system is the most confusing system for a young player that they could possibly be in. Steve Kerr has not exactly been like open to like bending rules for, for young players, bending the system for young players. Um, I think that other teams can talk themselves into getting Kaminga out of like a big trade. Like, I, I think they should push in their chips for like a Pascal Siakam or something. Like, I think that would be super cool next to a Draymond Green. It's not a perfect fit, but it raises your ceiling. Yeah, I, I guess. Okay, like here's one thing with the Warriors that I think it's like it's really worth talking about. Like when this team was winning like chip after chip, you have Steph and Clay who are both shooting like 42% from three. We just talked about, and there was like no other team in the league that had guards like that. We just talked about the Knicks, who Brunson and DiVincenzo are both shooting like 43 and 44% from three. And they're not the only team like that. And I think like this shooting edge that the Warriors have had on the NBA during their whole title run, like they don't have that edge anymore. Like, I don't know. I think this team is a lot further from a title than we all think, despite them winning it two years ago. They're not winning the title. Don't get me but wrong. Like, I don't think there's any construction with the core they have. If you trade the young guys, that's going to get them there. I mean, it's got to be like a young guy plus an old guard equals somebody more in the middle. Um, but yeah, it's tough. There's there's no easy, easy answers. I am just always of the like train of thought that you have to do whatever you can when you when you have a Steph Curry, I, especially for what he's done for your for your franchise. Patrick, do you want to know a trade? I think that uh, I came up with that is so hilariously bad that I think uh, both fan bases are going to vomit when they hear it. That's but that's what they say. All great trades, everyone would say no to. Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle for Stephen Curry, straight up. Oh. You give the Warriors more depth. You give them more scoring options. You kind of change what the team looks like. And then the Knicks get their superstar. Wow. Um, How much do you hate it? How much do you love it? I mean, I, I, I love it, <laughs> of course. I like, I don't know who, I, I the Warriors probably slammed down the phone first um, just because. It's Steph. It's Steph. But, um, yeah, I mean, wow, really, like, correcting everything that, like, should have been, could have been with the Warriors and the Knicks trying to draft Steph Curry on I draft know the Warriors, night. Like, the Warriors would rather, like, I feel like not win another championship if it means Steph plays there the rest of his career. So, obviously, it's a joke of a trade, but, man, Steph Curry in a Knicks uniform would just be... It would be electric. Yeah. Giving him the, just giving him the keys to the garden. Bro, it, Steph, OG, DiVincenzo... A big like rim defender, like 
slot in whoever at the four. Like I'm, I am ready. Like that team would be fun. Yeah, that would be so much fun. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know the perfect piece, but I just think like even just like changing the deck is like kind of what they need to do. Like I don't know, go out trade Chris Paul for Demar Derozan, just like straight up. Let's just see how it how it looks. Let's get more scoring in there. Here's what I think is going to happen when. And I actually think this is what they should do. I think they should let this season play out. I think they should let the old guard leave. Because I think the thing with Kaminga and Moody and even Pajimski to it, even though he's been pretty good, is just like, we're like, they're not that good. Okay, but they'll be 22 next year. They're going to be better next year. Like, maybe See, Kaminga's shot gets a little bit better next year. Maybe Moody, you know, for whatever reason, like, every lineup with Moody kind of sucks this year. Like, maybe that doesn't happen next year. Like... And I think, like, you know, you're going to have some cap space, more flexibility with Paul and Clay off the books. Like, maybe you run it back next year. You yeah. trade Wiggins in the offseason, and you actually run it back with the young guys and Steph, and you actually kind of tailor the roster to incorporate Kaminga and Moody more. I think that, to me, I think that's what I would do if I were them. I mean, the one young guy that is off the table for me is Pods. Like, that guy, it, could there be a more Warriors... <laughs> like young guy player, yeah then pods like he just he looks like steph running around off ball not that he's as effective but like you can tell like he understands the value of that i, I talked a couple episodes about how he's like the greatest guard sized guard rebounder rookie of all time like i i just i love what he's brought to the team but I, I don't know. Is Kaminga going to get better? Is the shooting going to get better? Kaminga's 21. Moody's 21. It kind of goes back to what I was saying. It's like 21-year-old players. Luka, I feel like Luka Doncic has like single-handedly like warped the way we view some of these young guys. Like Guys are not good at 21. Like NBA players are not good at 21. Guys don't play at 21. It's only like Bancaros, like uh, Sangoons. It's really only these like high blue-chip guys or like just really good players like a Jalen Duran. So like, I don't know. I just feel like my thing like about fast forward see. two years, Kaminga might be a way better player because he didn't really get to play a lot his first two years. So Kaminga has a, he's the, a restricted free agent next year, next year. Yeah. I don't want to pay him, but you might not have to. Yeah, maybe not. But that's the kind of guy that I feel like somebody's throwing like a huge offer sheet at just like to say whatever. Like if we get him, we get him like it's the baby max anyways. I don't think a team's going to do that. Like what team is signing up for Kaminga on a if Kaminga next year? Maybe is not same, a max, but a, a big contract. But like if Kaminga plays the way he played this year, next year, like I don't know who's signing up to give him twenty five million. 25 million i i don't know i i don't see the downside to paying him a contract that big if he doesn't progress the downside is like he just never is able to shoot and he's always a non-shooting wing that is but you can tell yourself like maybe if kerr's gone the after this season which i think he might be the conversation's completely different yeah, I, I, I guess me personally, it's like, but if Kaminga, if there's no downside, then why wouldn't the Warriors want to do that? I mean, you're you're in cap hell. That's why the war the Warriors have but been playing the luxury they're gonna, tax. Presumably, they're going to trade Wiggins. They're going to have Clay off the books, Chris off the books, and the only real things on the books is going to be Curry, Draymond, and these younger guys. But I think if they let it play out, they're not in that bad of a position. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but then again, you're just wasting your last couple of years of Steph. Most likely. Yeah. Most well, likely you're wasting your last couple of years of Steph. Which if you're okay with that, cool. But then at that point, I'm like, why don't you just trade Steph? I think though, if you make a move this year, you're locked, you're you're almost locked into that move. And that's the move that's the defining era of the end of the Steph career. Whereas if you wait till this offseason to make a decision, you actually have so much more flexibility on how you want to tackle the last four Steph years. So I almost view it as like it's better to sacrifice this one season and then give yourself flexibility for the next three than it is to make a win now trade this year. I yeah I don't know I I'll I will have to look more into like their cap sheet but I just don't know like what what that effect really is like I, I'm not sure if they even just let Clay and Chris walk 
I don't know if they actually have like cap space to work around even, especially once like these young guys start coming up. Well, so this off season on the books is going to be Curry. Who's got like a crazy gargantuan contract. Draymond, who's at that like what is it, twenty five million per year mark, and then Wiggins, who's in the high twenties, yeah. low thirties. I'm pretty sure next year Draymond goes up from twenty two to twenty four. Steph goes up from fifty one to fifty five. Um, so that's yeah, and then seventy nine. Chris, and then Wiggins goes up from twenty four to twenty six. That's one hundred five. Yeah, I mean that's thirty five million ish. Plus you have the other contracts on the books, but. They're not in that. I, I don't know. They're really, especially if you renegotiate with Clay, you bring Clay back on a smaller, smaller deal. Like, I, I don't think they're really in that bad of a spot, but I do think they could be if they rush this this year. Okay, here it is. Yeah. So just with the money on the books, they are one million away from the luxury tax for next year's. And that's without clay that's without chris no but wouldn't chris be on it because he's it's just that it's not guaranteed so they could cut him okay yeah 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 yeah. he's not guaranteed i don't know i yeah i mean there's a million different ways you can go and like i feel like this is like the ultimate like kind of fan conversation of like once it's once you know that you're not like a lockdown title contender is that enough or is it time to start rebuilding? And that's like the question for every sport. Yeah. And you're going to lean one way or the other on it. Should we get to best take, worst take? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get to best take, worst take. So my best take goes to uh, this is really apropos to the comp. Honestly, both of my best take, worst takes really relate to this Warriors conversation. And my best take goes to Charles Barkley said one thing I know about old people. They just get older. They don't get better. <laughs> and uh yeah, Steph 35, Clay 33, Chris Paul 38, Draymond 33. We're seeing it. <laughs> what about LeBron James? Well, LeBron. Yeah, I mean he's the exception. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. he's the exception to the rule, not the rule. Yeah, that's a pretty that's a pretty good take. I I, I love a, a good chuck. Um, this is also apropos to our conversation. Um, my best take is going to Stephen A. Smith, who said I'm a bigger star than most of the New York Knicks. That's a damn shame, which I agree. I am like so ready to see the day where like Jalen Brunson, he's an okay star level, but I want to see, like, I want to see your trade go through. I want to see the Knicks have a absolutely super duper mega star. You know who I think would just be so awesome in a New York Knicks uniform? Like it would just be electric. Sorry, Max. If we could get um, Anthony Edwards oh. on the Knicks, man, <laughs> can you imagine like just Edwards? I know he's not, you know, like top seven guy right now, but just his the personality, play style, the MJ, like, yeah. you know, like the aesthetics of it. Like, man, I'm deleting that part of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's OK, Max. People have been telling me how great it would be to see Devin Booker on the Knicks for as long as he has been in the NBA. No, Devin Booker, I don't want to see in a Knicks uniform. I want to see Ant. In the Knicks uniform. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. But this made me think, like, how many NBA players are more famous than Stephen A. Smith at this point? I'd say a good a good bunch. Like, but, like, how many really? Like, definitely, like, LeBron's more famous. Steph's more famous. Is Draymond Green more famous than Stephen A. Smith? I feel like he is. Because every single sports fan in America... No matter the sport, knows who Stephen A. Smith is. If you're not like a... I think the one thing, though, that we all kind of do is like when you're a part of an online community, whether that's like a Twitter, a Reddit, or a YouTube, I think things tend to feel like really larger than life. And then you realize how many people are offline. That's what I'm saying. That's, That's exactly what I'm saying is Stephen A. Smith is like national TV a lot of these like basketball players, like I don't I don't know if I'm ready to say that Devin Booker is more famous than Stephen A. Smith. I agree this is a great take. Not disagreeing that it's not worthy of best take, especially the end part where he says that's a damn shame. Because <laughs> what he's saying about the Knicks in particular, yeah. I'm with you. I, yeah, I mean, he's like more people are gonna know Stephen A. Smith than like Dante Givincenzo. No doubt. I would say I, he he's definitely more famous than Julius Randle and uh, 
and Jalen Brunson, in my mind. The thing is that like a lot of people know what like they know they see that guy and they're like, oh, I know this guy. But they probably don't know what his name is. They're just like, oh, that's the guy that talks about big booty Latino women on Twitter sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the guy that said Lamar Odom was on crack. Yeah. yeah. You know, we should uh maybe next episode we should do the Stephen A follower count versus the NBA. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, he let's, probably let's bring the stats next time. We'll we'll do a full deep dive on Stephen A. Stephen fame A versus next the NBA. episode. Yeah. Okay, my worst take. This is just awful. Colin Coward. Oh, did you see this? No, I didn't. I have no idea what you're about to say. Quote: Is he going to win a title? Ask yourself. Jason Tatum broke into the NBA, and he wasn't as refined as LeBron or Steph. He wasn't as tough as Kawhi. He wasn't as battle-hardened as the old guard. He had about a two-year window to win a title because now he has to go through Giannis in his prime, Jokic in his prime, Doncic in his prime, and I'm not sure if he's as good as any of these guys. Was his windows two years ago? So we're questioning if Jason Tatum can win a championship. Patrick, I'm going to tell you Jason Tatum's age right now. It's 25. Damn. Now here's the age of all the guys he listed when they won their first title. LeBron, 27. Steph, 26. Kawhi, 22. But the Raptors run was at 27. Giannis, 26. Jokic, 27. Tatum is still younger than all of those guys were when they won their first title. And I'm going to tell you right now, outside of Steph, I don't think any of those guys had anywhere near as good a supporting cast as Tatum did, does currently. And yeah, like, I don't think Tatum's as good as Luka Doncic. But do I think the Boston Celtics are way better than the Dallas Mavericks? Yes. And teams win titles, not players. Exactly. That That is the point that you have to say. And, you know, it's something that I do all the time as well. But it's the, like, playerification of NBA discourse, which it's so easy to do when you're calling Cowherd and you're talking on the radio for 100 million hours a week. But, like, yeah, it's not Jason Tatum playing one-on-one against Giannis. It's not Jason Tatum playing one-on-one against Luka to figure out who's winning the NBA title. It's the Boston Celtics, and he has a team of literal all-stars behind him. Like, this is such a crazy bad take. Yeah, that's a terrible take. Um, I feel like (laughs) I've got a pretty pretty bad take as well. It's on, like, a smaller scale, but... um, Did you see LeBron's poster dunk last night? Yes. I'm sure you did. Right over Paul Paul George. George. Even though it was kind of one of those fake posters in my mind where it's like. Well, there wasn't a great. There wasn't really a contest. If you're standing at like a really good angle, you're going to get like a a better angle where it looks like LeBron's really baptizing Paul George. He did contact him a little bit, though, right? A little bit. But see, what's impressive about those, though, is even if you only touch him a little bit, like. I mean, jumping that high and hey. knowing you're going to get clipped is is scary. Super impressive. But James Worthy, who is getting my worst take of the <laughs> week, said that was the dunk of the century. The century? The century. That's not even the best dunk of LeBron's career. That's not even the best dunk of LeBron's Lakers tenure. I, th- that's not even the best dunk of the last, like... Year and a half. Did he not see Aaron Gordon take Landry Shamit's soul last so, I'm Christmas pretty sure day? John Morant like postered Wembenyama on a contest like last week. Um, yeah, isn't that an insane? Th- like Paul George has a better dunk than that over the last century. Is he like a commentator? Like, well, yeah, he does the Lakers like sports like net spectro post game show. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he's like watching basketball. I, I would have to deep dive it, but I can almost guarantee you James Worthy has a better dunk than that this century. All right. I, I Pat, you guys are going to laugh. I always get weird with century. Century is, is what again? 100 years. 100 years. So that would be 2000 and onward. Yeah. So he's saying this is the best dunk right, since yeah, the year 2000. Yeah. Oh my it's God. definitely not. It's definitely not that. It's just no way. What Vince what? Carter jumped over Frederick Weiss this century. Bro, Giannis jumped over Hart. LeBron jumped over that one dude on the Bulls. LeBron killed <laughs> Jason Terry. Yeah, the LeBron Terry dunk is something else. It was kind of yeah. I, I what is your guys? What do you guys think the best dunk of the century was? Honestly, the LeBron over Terry is like maybe I think with my the favorite whole like dunk. commentary is just. Cole Chalmers, James! 
shoes. And the way like Jason Terry is like laying like in a grave at the end. But also, I don't know. Some of those DeAndre Jordan ones it's are hard, so good. It's hard to pick like a favorite, but one that I love in conjunction with the commentary is I think it's like an early 2000s Lakers game where Kobe's on a fast break and it looks like it's going to be a normal dunk. And there's like, I think there's a defender running with him. And Kobe like reverse 360s and posters it. And the guy's like, look out below for Kobe Bryant. Yeah, <laughs> it's that like is electric. My favorite or... I, yeah, probably the best Suns dunk was uh, Amari Stoudemire absolutely destroying, I think, O'Donnell Foyle from the Warriors. Uh, shout out Tom oh, wait, Leander. No. I know what the elevate best. Elevate and detonate. I'm sorry. The best dunk. I don't care what anyone says. It's Dwayne Wade over Verizal. Oh, that is that a great dunk. That is just absurd. Like, he jumps from so out far out away from the rim, and Verizal is huge and wade just completely bodies him and it's just like <laughs> the guys the commentators like baffled at what they just saw um do, do you have a, a dunk that comes to mind max i don't have a real answer but i was gonna say i think about aaron gordon jumping over the car a lot yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i mean not contest. even to mention dunk contest dunks <laughs> yeah. yeah there's been a lot of great ones shout out to ant over uh was it yuda Oh yeah. Oh, it was like yeah. Ant's first yeah, real yeah, yeah, like yeah. holy holy ant dunk. Yes. That was That's a crazy. That's like when one. the world was introduced to ant. To yeah. ant, yeah. Yeah, that was a really rough one. Okay, like how are we what's the worst take of the week? I Ooh, think these are the these both, are both the really best good. contenders we've had for a couple weeks. Okay. The thing the thing about these two takes. Your take is easily wrong immediately. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. My take, like, coward, we could be sitting here three years from now being like, holy shit, the Celtics lost to the Heat again? He didn't have that dog in him. Like, Tatum really got showed up by Jimmy Butler for a third time? Or we could be like, wow, Joel Embiid really upped his game, or Giannis really proved that he's the defining player of the East this whole time. Like, there's a world where Colin Coward ends up being right. Then and he's like, he, he gets even brownie points because of how stacked the Boston Celtics are. So I think because that door is open for Coward, I have to, I got to give it to James Worthy here. Okay, I, I am totally comfortable with doing that. Congrats, James Worthy. You really edged out a, a great contender. But um, can we, can we, I have a fun story because Worthy obviously played on some of those old Laker teams, right? Like the 80s Lakers. I went to a Lakers game, I want to say five years ago around Ben Simmons' first or second season league. I went to a Sixers-Lakers game. And I'm with my friend Jason, and we're sitting like 10 rows back. And Jason, who doesn't know a lot about basketball, is like, who do you think is going to win? And this is pre-LeBron, post-Kobe Lakers. This is like the mess of a Lakers The team. Jordan Clarkson. Yeah, I D'Angelo think this is the year Russell. before Lonzo might have even been there. Maybe Lonzo was hurt. And Jason's like, who do you think is going to win? And we're watching Embiid and Simmons warm up. And Simmons is throwing down like windmills. And Embiid, it's if you haven't seen Embiid in person, like he towers over the other NBA players. And I go, bro, Lakers have no chance. All of a sudden, I just feel like a on my leg. And Michael Cooper is sitting in front of me and he goes, Don't talk about my Lakers that way. And I go, Have you seen Joel Embiid? <laughs> well, this is like Embiid's second or third season, but I'm like, dude, this guy is going to eat the Embiid proceeds to just like and Simmons, both of them, because this is like when Ben Simmons was fucking awesome. Proceed to just dismantle the Lakers in a game where I don't even think they play like most of the third or the entire fourth quarter. That is an amazing story. <laughs> I love that story. I was like, dude, look, like I love the Lakers, but bro, it's it's Joel Embiid. Like we've got fucking baby Julius Randle guarding him. This is this this is not a matchup. Yeah, people forget how bad those teams were. Those like Byron Scott put it put together by who who's their GM? Oh, the late Cupcheck. Yes, yes, Mitch. Mitch Cupcheck. Yeah, those those Lakers teams were really, really bad. They missed the playoffs for like nine years. And I feel like we just completely forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, they were bad. They were bad. They were bad. They were bad. Was Kobe still? That no, year this was after, after Kobe? Kobe. This was like a year or two after Kobe retired. So it must have been like it was like 20, 18, 18, 16, 17. I think it was like yeah. 18, yeah. Maybe LeBron's last Cleveland year. I think it was 18, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Man, I, I kind of miss those Sixers teams, oddly, though. They were fun. Yeah. I kind of miss those Lakers teams. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. Well, you know what comes with those Lakers teams? Those Suns teams. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. <laughs> 
We're going to head off. We're kind of rambling here. We'll catch you guys on the Thursday pod. Thank you for watching. Peace.